team, it's that time again. You know whenever we do live Q&As, we have a party. It actually should be called party Q&As, because that's really what it is. We're having a good time, we're ready to rock. Let's do this, it's party time, Q&A time. Where else do you get to have as much fun exploring the bullshit of life, the hard things of relationship? So I'm doing a live Q&A with Dr. Alexandra Salmon. If you don't know her, she is a relationship wizard. She is so freaking brilliant. So we're going to dive in. We had a new uh, podcast episode come out today with her as well. But you're about to hear I've got questions I haven't even read. But I'm so excited to get Dr. Salmon here. Here she is. Get ready to rock. Hello, Dr. Salmon. Hello. Okay, send request. I'm requesting you. There we go. We did it. I heard the word party, so here I am. I mean, is there another way to have conversation about relational stuff than to have fun, you know? We have to have fun. Because it's, it's already hard. hard enough, you know? That's right. <laughs> Being vulnerable is, I've never heard someone say, like, I was super vulnerable last night, and it was so fun. <laughs> I've literally oh. never heard. That's right. Gratifying, rewarding, intimacy producing, but not fun. I was thinking to uh, yesterday, just like having a hard, hard conversations. And I was thinking about how like we often equate hard conversations as not love, but not realizing that they are. And, and we think that love is just puppy dogs and ice cream and Disney, as opposed to like love is, the, is telling the truth. And, and that's why love isn't always fun. You know? That's right. That's right. And the, the hard conversations open us to the puppies and the ice cream and <laughs> what else? Disney. It's way easier to be Disney uh, with somebody where you know that if and when you've got something to say, you'll be able to say it. And if you could say it over ice cream with a puppy, that is the best, you know? I feel like we're probably done. Like, I think we did an hour's worth of work. <laughs> okay. All the answers to all Bye, of guys. this. Right. Done. Get a puppy and some ice cream, <laughs> and it's good. Except don't use a puppy as a distraction from the truths you're not talking about, like we use babies <laughs> and all those things. Well, that's um, right. That's right. So, okay. So, I'm so excited to have you here. For those of you that don't know Dr. Alexandra Salman, she's a professor at Northwestern. She teaches marriage and family therapy. She is a marriage and family therapist. She is the author of two books, Taking Sexy Back, which is all about reclamation of your sexy. It's a fantastic book. It's written to women. I read it as a man and benefited substantially. It's incredible. And it will blow your mind the things that you didn't know about sex and sexuality. Second book, which is actually her first book, is Loving Bravely. And that is when people ask me, like, what's one of the best books I could read to begin and or continue my relational journey? And without a doubt, Loving Bravely is a top book for that. So author, therapist, magician, um, amazing hair. Welcome. One, one time you called me a genius, and I really liked that. A vagin is it? I, and I can't even claim that because I got it from, uh, Stifler on, uh, not Stifler. Stifler's <laughs> not that. He was more, uh, he was more obnoxious. Uh, Schmidt on New Girl. <gasps> New Girl. Oh my gosh. Because he met a woman who was a gynecologist and a lesbian and, and he said, you must be of a genius. I love it. I, I mean, it. it's such a great term. I, w I, I couldn't have made it up. It's too no, smart. It's, too, um, it's really good. So we've got five questions. Um, we might as well roll through them. Like, I'll read the first one. You answer it. Bam, we'll fly. You know how it goes. You ready to rock? I'm ready to rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is everybody watching ready to rock? Because this is, this is, imagine getting a lecture by Dr. Alexander Solomon. This is how fun it is. Um, mm. Okay, <laughs> so first question. I was repeatedly cheated on by my ex-boyfriend years ago. Five years on, I still can't stomach my new partner having friends of the opposite sex. My partner is trustworthy, but this anxiety is pushing him away and actually making him less open with telling me about his friendships and social circle. Is this fixable? Mm -hmm. I mean, solve that. yeah, right. Well, I'm grateful for this question because how often do we see this in our work, right? This comes up a lot and it, highlights one of the central principles of the Loving Bravely book and the concept of relational self-awareness, which is that our past comes with us. 
whether that's our family of origin past, which we're oftentimes talking about childhood dynamics, but our relationship past comes with us as well. So my first thought in response to this question is, of course, right? Of course, this is an issue. And I would, you know, if we were sitting here talking with her, um, I would want to tweak the word fixable and I would want to invite her to use the word carryable or manageable, right? What was because the word? carryable. And I'll just not carryable. Really word. Yeah. Now it's a new word. I like it. It work makes sense. I think like carryable. Carry, I think it works. carry able. I like it. <laughs> or manageable, right? Because we're not she will never not be, in this lifetime at least, she will never not be somebody who's been cheated on. That is right. a part of her story. And the line she's walking is she doesn't want to punish her new partner for a crime he did not commit, mm. right? And, um, and what, I would, what I would want to make sure they do, the problem is not that she's too controlling and the problem is not that he's too lackadaisical or something or too careless. The problem is the dance. And that's one of the central things we do in the Loving Bravely book is we really shift from this, either it's me or it's you, into this language of the choreography, the dance, the pattern, the cycle. And it has my stuff, and she's clear as a bell that her stuff is that she was cheated on. And it's his stuff, which maybe it's a struggle for him to kind of offer reassurance. Uh, and that makes the dance, you know? And so the more she questions, the more he shuts down, the more he sh shuts down, of course, the more she questions. So they're, they're caught in this dance. And, it's, and the problem is the dance. The problem isn't one of them, per se. I'm on the move to get a headphone because I think I was causing an echo. Good. Can I love it. I like, hear me? I like a, mark, Can you hear me now? a mark in motion. Yeah, yeah this is Instagram Live, not Instagram recorded and not Mark walking through the house. So walking through the house, I'm back. Okay, so <laughs> I love um, that you said he shouldn't be punished for a crime he didn't commit. And, you know, I can relate to this question because my partner when I was young, she was cheated on before me. And so, or sorry, until I just projected. I was cheated on before I dated her. And when I dated her, I remember being jealous at the bar one day. And she looked at me and she said, um, I go home with you. And like, I can help you navigate this, but I'm not going to tolerate your jealousy that is beyond what I am deserving of. And she said, like, I can help you navigate this, but I can't. She became a counselor, not shocking. But I remember hearing that from her and kind of having this, like, reassurance that made me rest. Yep. And, and I really saw how the betrayal that I had experienced before, I saw how the new partner was able, like, didn't have to pay the crime, but was able to be compassionate to the experience. But because she had no, she, had, she didn't have tolerance for it being put on her. Right. And I saw how unfair that was. I really did. Mm -hmm. I saw how it wasn't fair to her and that that um, she could be part of the healing rather than the perpetuation of the wounding. Do you know what I mean? I do. So when I think of like carryable, I think of like, I love what you said. You're never going to be someone who wasn't cheated on in this lifetime. And um, maybe you missed red flags previously and maybe you didn't honor yourself in the previous relationship because I often see that when we experience external betrayals, we often have internally betrayed ourselves. And so the external betrayal becomes uh, the outcome of internal betrayals, which is not to justify That's or right. say That's it's right. someone's fault that they got That's betrayed. Right. It's to observe that self betrayals often uh, exist beyond or earlier um, in there. So my thought is like, can you, how would you language it to your partner to enroll them in the healing? How would you do that? Oh, I love it. I love it. I think that a question that she could ask him is she could say like, listen, when, you know, we got to figure out a way for you to surround yourself with friendships that nourish your soul, that boost you, that elevate you, that, you know, that, that we all need a village. It takes a village to, to right. raise any one of us. And, when, when I hit a moment, like when I hit a moment, when I'm triggered or activated or insecure, how might I reach for you 
in a way that invites you into allyship with me versus mm. pushes you away. How do I yeah, do that? I love that because she said her anxiety is causing him to pull away and not be as honest. And, you know, having dated someone who got really jealous for, I never incited it. It was due to insecurity. And I remember saying like, listen, how do I manage whatever's going on for you? Because I'm not going to tolerate you, like you looking at my phone or anything like that because I didn't earn it. Yep. But I also want to be mindful of like, where is this coming from? How do I love this part of you? Because deep, we're dealing with the content. You're, you're looking at my phone when I'm not around. There's nothing on there. And you yep. can if you really want to. And you shouldn't have to. So what's the security that, because you know, it's like we talk about content, like you left the wet towel on the bed, you didn't do this, you didn't, um, or you like someone's picture on Instagram, yeah. but really it's that I have an emotional need that's below that, that's not being met, that likely has to relate to safety and security in the relationship. And, you know, it's hard when, when we've been caught off guard by betrayal, then all of a sudden, we, even if there's security and safety and they're loving, if we've been caught off guard, we have this constant vigilance. So what would you recommend from, because uh, the language is saying, how do you become my ally in this yeah. rather than me pushing you away? Love that because in the book, Loving Bravely, you talk about two people turning shoulder to shoulder towards a problem rather than making one or the other person the problem, but that we relationally, when we turn shoulder to shoulder against something, we team up. Like we team up and I love that because it makes you feel like, like if one of us has a challenge that we have both of us working towards it. And isn't that the most alchemizing loving thing we can do? It's so beautiful. It brings tears to my eyes when I think about all of, you know, I'm Todd and I are about to have our 23 year anniversary. And, um, and I, you know, you and I have talked about this before that one of my, the place that my kind of wounds that are from childhood, I'm at risk of, when things are hard, kind of making a making it a one person job. Like I have to manage this. I have to fix this. I've got to figure out how to carry this. And when I catch myself, which I'm infinitely better at doing that now than I used to be, <laughs> when I catch myself and I turn toward Todd, we figure out how to carry it together. And it becomes intimacy producing um, mm. rather than lonely. And, um, and that's what, that's what I want this couple to do, you know, to do as well. And I think that he can, um, I think he can ask her like, you know, I mean, ultimately there's a measure which you're getting to so beautifully. There's a measure of which, um, you know, I would want, if she was um, our client, I would want to be talking to her about how she recovered from that blow because to discover or to have somebody's betrayal disclosed it is it flips your world upside down right it is yeah. it can literally feel crazy making like what i thought was reality is not reality it is incredibly unsettling yeah. people have been cheated on like research has shown 70 percent of those people um will show like scores in the ptsd range the clinical range so we're seeing rumination and sleeplessness and self-doubt and emotional dysregulation like it makes so much sense it is traumatic in that I didn't, what I'm living in is not what I thought I was living in. So I really would want her to turn backwards a bit in the service of moving forwards and look at how did I recover? What did I do? Mm. How did I heal from that? And did I come into this new relationship without healing? And so many of us do this, right? We just are like, okay, well that sucked, push it down, you know, hike up my, put my big girl panties on and just keep on plugging. That's so often how we cope is just keep going. So she may need some individual support, the Loving Bravely book, the book club, the community um, therapy, you know, to just turn backwards and work on whatever kind of unhealed stuff she's bringing with her, as you were naming, like what, you know, were there ways that she was um, missing red flags, ignoring things, or just to, to just process the pain of it. So that maybe then it's a bit more neutral. Not that it ever goes away, but that it's just a bit more neutral. And the two of them can work out a dance for when he heads out with his friends, you know, kind of, they have these agreements and then he goes and then he comes home, you know, and they're together and he comes home to her. Yeah, because I think of when he's out with his friends or he has these uh, opposite sex partners in this context, it's like not feeding the jealousy inducing behaviors but like allowing 
your partner to sit in the discomfort, but making sure that you're following through on the agreements you have, because mm -hmm. if you're not, then you're going to, so if you're like, I'll check in with you later and there are agreements you come up with together yeah. and then you resent that you have to do it. So you don't do it. That means that you are not honoring yourself. So you have to come up with agreements that you actually feel like, and there has to be progression, right? Like <laughs> there has to be progression and it's like boundaries. You know, you talk about this in the book too. Uh, they're, they're movable. Like they move mm -hmm. as trust mm -hmm. regains. And so, you know, when I, one of the things that your book does, and I remember one of the quotes that it talks about is that what, how you tell your story matters more than what actually happened to you. Okay. And that's so powerful because so many of us, when we tell our story, uh, we, we frame it in a way that we are the victim, which is not to say that we aren't the victim of things, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but to say that, when we stay in the mindset of it, like if I could tell the story, this happened, occurred to me and it was horrible and da, 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 here's what I learned, here's what's powerful, here's how it grew me. Um, so for people watching, mm. Dr. Salman and I are doing a book club and it's with Loving Bravely and we figured like summertime, when better time to do a book club. And so you can just go to the link in my bio to sign up. Early bird's still on, we're super pumped about it. Um, should we get to question two? We, my gosh, I mean, we could stay on this one all day, couldn't we? It's a really, I'm so glad that we, we talked about that. Such before. a good question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. I'm going to, I'm going to tee you up. Uh, it's Let's another go. question about infidelity. So ready? Here's mm -hmm. the pitch. What if I was the cheater? I am the one who does avoidant behaviors and uses cheating and other terrible actions to get out of facing my own shit. I even betrayed my best friend by sleeping with her crush at one point. I don't even know where to start. Where does she start? Oh, what a level of awareness though. The, because in order to even write this question, you have to have increased your capacity for shame. Like you're claiming behaviors that you know are out of integrity with who you are. And I'd say as a general morality, you know, sort of meter, we'd all say like, yeah, that would be really hard, especially for your friend. But we often think like, especially for the friend, but especially for you to hold. Because when I think about the person who asked this question, I think about how they must, what they must believe about themselves, you know? And I think often, and I'd love to hear your take on this, Dr. Salman, often when we're kids, we often um, kick up dust and do things, sabotage, we become the fuck up, become the, to get noticed. You know, like I've read in a lot of parenting behavioral stuff where it talks about how like, a, a misbehaving child who's acting out, that's like symptom number whatever of disconnection, the need for security, the need for safety, the need for connection. And so as an adult, you know, I often like when you think about why would someone cheat when things are about to get good? Well, because things are about to get good because we don't trust it because maybe we don't believe we're worthy of it. And you know, I remember thinking about like, okay, well, often we don't receive, we don't allow ourselves to receive love because we don't believe we're worthy of it. And I remember talking to a friend about that and she said, I don't actually agree. I don't agree that we don't believe we're worthy of it because that would sort of go against human nature that we want to be loved, that we want to be in connection. She said that somewhere along the line, we were taught not to trust it. Hmm. And I thought, wow, that actually is such hmm. a beautiful reframe because- yeah. One makes it like, who am I to believe that I'm not worthy of love? I, but I want to be loved. And so it really shows that it's like, oh, it's actually that I just don't trust that when people get close to me, that I'm, that I'm worthy of being loved, but I don't trust that they're going to treat me well. I don't trust that it's going to go well. I don't trust that it's going to be safe. Um, right. Right. And so I think often when we become cheaters is we're like, blowing up good things. Maybe we're uh, about to hit the upper limit in our relationship. Maybe we're about to go to the other end. Maybe we're about to surrender. Um, and it pushes people away. It's a distancing strategy. It's also the way that some people leave relationships because if you end a relationship, you're considered a bad person. Uh, but you know, if you cheat on someone, you're certainly judged as well, but you'll definitely be able to leave. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So yeah, many, as you're so saying. Many layers. Yes, that's right. It, it may be a, a quitting before you get fired idea, right? But if it's, yeah, yeah. If it's, I, um, yeah, when I was, you know, prepping these responses, I wrote, you can't handle my truth. And so that would be my question to this person is like, 
you know, let's rewind the tape and look at like when you were a little, do we know this is a woman? I feel like we knew it was a woman. Yeah. Um, you know, when you were a little girl, who couldn't handle your truth, right? Who, who gave you the feedback that all of you is too much of you? And actually, we just can handle this little sliver of you. Because so often that's what happens in infidelity. It's like, I can't break, to bring my full self here, like to put all my eggs in this basket, this relationship is really, really risky. So I'm going to just kind of, you know, parse myself, the little hokey pokey of love and put like a little bit of myself here and a little bit of myself there. <laughs> um, and that oftentimes is a, is a response to a family system dynamic when you had to be, as you're saying, the fuck up or the perfect one or the invisible one. Um, and, and that's what unhel unhealthy family systems do that. They kind of freeze and put people into roles to simplify, to create like a pseudo homeostasis, like a pseudo stability. Like if you're this, then we know what to expect. If you're this, we know what to expect. Because dynamic relationships of like one day you're naughty and one day you're sweet and one day, that takes so much more emotional bandwidth to see the shifts and the changes to ask the questions. And so unhealthy families, overwhelmed families um, will kind of freeze people. And so I, I would wonder if this person, as you said, as you hypothesize, maybe this person got stuck in that fuck up role. So this is the grown up version of it. I think I find also that people who go on to cheat in adult romantic relationships, they often grew up in a family system where they saw their parents cheating. Yeah. And so it's almost like a, an attempt to understand it or master it, um, or they sat with, you know, the parent who was betrayed, they sat with that parent in, in endless, endless, endless pain. And so the thought is, I can't do that. So I got to do the other. Not that interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. And 180 degrees, right? 180 degrees is really never the answer. But sometimes it's tempting. It's like, okay, all I know is not that I am not gonna I don't want to waste this. my life being my parent who never let it go. Yeah. Um, and you also stay in the high of the infidelity. You stay in the high of the excitement. I remember mm -hmm. Esther Perel saying, Esther Perel, saying that, um, you know, if the couple she worked with who had infidelity put as much effort into their relationships as they do their <laughs> infidelity, they wouldn't have to see her. And I think in a lot of ways, that's true. Yeah. And um, we have to create room for why. Like, why? Right. Because I think anyone with good emotional health or mental health or whatever we might call it um, is, is, is still capable of infidelity. And I think this is such a triggering thing for people that a normal good person can cheat because yes. we vilify cheaters. And this always causes a huge shit storm on my Instagram. Here it but comes. it's so important because the to, to say if unless it's a serial cheating narcissist who that's all they do that's a totally different animal and we're not even talking about that but if we're someone who cheats and we know that we do that and we've even betrayed our best friend by sleeping with their crush there's something about like you said when i get into a relationship i'm too much like i can be too much or i'm broken and i'm not worthy of and i i hurt people and i, I would imagine there was a narrative in their childhood that they hurt people, that their behaviors hurt others and they're selfish and they're, and so they're sort of like reliving that. And I love that you said that they get frozen mm -hmm. because adult ways of getting attention are, hey, I need to talk to you. <laughs> hey, we need to have a chat. Hey, I feel disconnected from you. Child ways of doing that or teenager ways, you could sort of, I would say that, I, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this, but I would imagine that someone who's more of a saboteur is likely more in like that teenager yeah. phase. Um, yeah. You know, and yeah, I think this is such, the person asking the question is so brave because they clearly want to deal with it and want to get to the root of this. And so my invitation, because it says, I don't even know where to start. You already started, so continue. And that's such a beautiful thing. And to rest into what Dr. Solomon is talking about is to explore your story, right? To explore, like in Loving Bravely, that's what you do is you, you write out what's your story. You figure out what your story is. Is there any other parts of Loving Bravely that you think would really apply to this? That's a great question. You know, I, 
I think that there's, um, you know, in Loving Bravely, there's there, we talk about sexual intimacy, you know, in, in several different places, but it also is why I knew I had to come back with a second book that was entirely about sexual self-awareness because there's more there. And I finished that book and I was like, oh God, there's more there. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. sort of, end, right? This work is endless and infinite, but I also would want her to do some exploring around her sexuality because there is, you know, the research is crystal clear that early on in romantic relationships, there's a lot of what we call spontaneous desire, a lot of just like feeling horny and feeling like I just got to get with you and I can't. Let's do this all the time. Let's do this. And it is normative to experience shifts, um, what, but it is frightening and it is, it, it can be frightening and it can be confusing and it can be sad when I go from wanting to make love with you every single day to feeling like, oh, how, long, how long has it been? And that we have to do, we move more from spontaneous to more of a responsive desire. And responsive desire means that we have to partner around cultivating erotic contexts that trigger my desire, that create novelty, that celebrate um, the beauty of making love to the same person over and over again, right? There's something so beautiful about that, but it is not fueled by the same chemical mix or the same psychological mix that really, really early sex is fueled by. So I also wonder, you know, mm -hmm. she's focusing a lot in this question around conflict and avoidant behaviors, but I wonder what happens to, as we would say in Taking Sexy Back, what happens to her sexy? Where does her sexy go when she settles into a relationship and how might she continue to celebrate and cultivate a lot of erotic connection that maybe then would keep her within the boundaries, the frame that she and her partner have set? Yeah, because a lot of people don't know, and you do mention this in uh, Taking Sexy Back, that in the research, I believe you mentioned it, remind me if, if I'm wrong, um, that women actually in the research get bored of monogamy That's sooner. Right. And that to people is like, what? Because we, we have socialized women to believe that they are monogamous and they just want one partner and men are the ones who stray and it's just natural for men to do that as opposed to like two humans, whatever their relational type they wanna choose are agreeing to something. But it's not saying if you're monogamous that you'll never have desire for other people. Like I, um, I know somebody who asked me like, my partner says I can only interact for 15 seconds with somebody, and with a, a, someone of the opposite sex. And I can't look them in the eye while I'm talking to them and I'm like, Oh my God, like that's actually, first off, very controlling and yep, pretty yep. dramatic red flags. Um, yep. But I think because we've not normalized that desire doesn't go anywhere for other people, but it's what do we do with it? Can I take it and redirect it mm -hmm. uh, into my relationship, into creativity? And you said like, where does her sexy go? Where does our desire go? If it's not fueled by dopamine, serot you know, all the things that are like, we will bang anywhere at any time. And then three <laughs> years later, you're like, I mean, will we bang? Right. Like, Should do you want to mix it up and do doggy style this week, you know, or this <laughs> month or whatever right. it is. Right. And right. I think what's so interesting, and that's a whole other subject, is that Eric Fromm in his book, The Art of Loving, he says, we mm -hmm. confuse falling in love with being in love. And... I love that because there's this transition to a stasis of safety and security. But if it is, if it is joined with the loss of self and enmeshment and codependency, desire will go right out the window. Like That's desire right. will That's leave right. as soon as you have left your own identity. And there's not enough cunnilingus in the world to fix that. I'm sorry. There's probably a fair amount of fellatio and cunnilingus that can nurture that. <laughs> but. I'd also say if there's a loss of self, you know, I remember talking to this couple who said like, we have great communication, everything's great, but in intimacy, we don't, um, there's something up with intimacy. And I said, do you tell him the truth? And she said, yeah, we talk about everything we do. And I was like, when you're intimate, do you tell him the truth about what feels good? And she said, no, sometimes I hold back because I don't want to hurt his feelings. I'm like, that yeah. will kill desire. Like Absolutely. you just killed it because now you have to placate to his feelings. Well, you're supposed to be in your sexy. You're actually in his head thinking about how he feels yep. about your body and what feels good. But if you're willing to tell him the truth, then you'll bring desire back. 
because there's you're not being codependent. It's so interesting how the subtle um, self-censoring, yep. which I think we're doing a lot of, especially now, just yep. subtle points of self-censoring kill desire. They deaden. They deaden. Yes. Yes. I, you know, and any, any woman and every woman who doesn't speak truth in the bedroom, faking orgasms is another way this often happens. Let's be really clear. She did not pull that dynamic out of thin air. From the time we're little girls, we are taught to read and cue ourselves off of what the boys and men around us want. And I'm not even talking sexually. Like I um, spent a week with my, we had a big family reunion and I was with my stepfather who is dear to me. Um, and I noticed all we, I was keying off of him all week long. Does he want a sandwich? What kind of sandwich? Like, how's his mood? Like, I just was so <laughs> right. aware. And it was like little girl conditioning, right? Like, I'm sure I did that from the moment he married my mom when I was four years old. And I just was so aware of all these ways that in patriarchy, and you and I often reference Harriet Lerner's, um, you know, notion that we, you know, whatever the sort of marginalized group is, needs to really understand and attune to the ways of those who have more power. And so how does that not go into the bedroom? And I love, I mean, I love everything that you have said about that. But I also, I think we all need me to go back to the fact that like maybe three minutes ago, you started a sentence with doggy style, and then you ended it with Eric Frome, which I don't, I think probably has never <laughs> been done. But I just Eric Fromm has never been, unless Eric Fromm I'm, was doing doggy style, I'm, maybe that's never I'm just occurred. so here. So here yeah. for it, Mark. The, I'm just so here for it. <laughs> I love the merger, right? The academic with the fun, with the all the things. So yeah. if you're loving this conversation, this is the Loving Bravely Book Club. Uh, and we get to explore all these things. We've still got some more questions, but make sure you go to the link in my bio and sign up. Because if you're like, how do I navigate that? How do I deal with my own stuff? How does it show up in my relationship? How do I own my lane and my partner own their lane? This is how you do it. You do the work. And this is the work. And the work can be fun, which you is, know what? And, and I the think, work not is, what we know. Right. The work is best done in community. I remember the first, so the book came out in, a, in February, and I taught my Marriage 101 class in the spring. And so that was the first year that the book was, you know, woven into that curriculum. And I had a student come to office hours, and she said, um, so my question is, I like read three pages and then I cry for a while and then I read three more pages. So is that normal? And I was like, oh, honey, I, I love it. And sometimes, right, yeah. tears, sometimes we are afraid of tears, but tears can be incredibly cleansing and mm. clarifying and illuminating. Um, but it, but it was, is a reminder that the book is challenging, right? The book is, I mean, my, my intent and my voice is gentle and the work is hard. And so I love that what you have done, Mark, is offered us a community, a place to be together in this work, because um, it's hella easier to do this when you've got other people who are kind of in the muck with you. And that's what we're, that's what we're going to offer here. And I'm so proud of that. And I'm so grateful to you for that. All right, you ready for question three? Lay it on and me. And the book club is automated. You don't even have to buy the book, but you should buy the book because you join along with it. And um, you can it's all automated though you can do it on kajabi you get two live calls with dr solomon to pick her brain and it's fantastic you just go to the link in my bio okay question three every time i meet someone genuine i seem to find a new reason to end it i start to look for minor issues and use them to cause huge fights or i find reasons to avoid instead of going deeper is this my intuition saving me or ruining my life well ruining my life is dramatic but I like it because clearly you're connected to the outcomes that this is creating. So hit it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the place I want to start with this question, which is a wonderful question. I want to first like kind of name uh, like the, just the developmental trajectory of life, right? Like we become young adults, we're dating, um, you know, we're in a new era in that, most of us live a number of love stories. My own story of um, marrying Todd at age 25 is now, you know, like more of an anomaly. The age, the average age of entry into marriage is later. The rate of marriage, you know, is has decreased. So there's a lot of people who have a lot of love stories, ins and outs of relationships. And so what can be challenging is like, even if you know in the back of your mind, like one of these love stories is, is not going to end. This is going to become my partner. This is the person I'm going to roll, you know, grow old with. Like we will declare our sides of the bed 
and those will be our size of the bed when we're 85. <laughs> and so I feel like we don't give enough voice to the fact that even with the joy and the beauty of, of what she's saying, like it's a genuine person and a genuine relationship, it's really hard to hold that along with the grief that it means like now I'm potentially done dating, potentially forever. And the heaviness or the maturity of like, holy shit, I am choosing somebody. I am trusting myself enough to choose you, to partner with you, to deepen with you, to build a life with you, to buy a home with you or rent a home with you, get a dog with you, have a baby with you. That is big, like existentially big. And so I just, I feel like we don't do enough normalizing. Like I think sometimes we're so at risk, you know, she's into this intuition ruining my life which maybe I think we do need to dive down into that but let's start by just saying it's big it's really big to say oh my god I think I'm really gonna go all in with this person and we're talking about marriage we're talking about moving in that's it's, it's a big developmental step in a relationship certainly but also in your own identity of who you are that you are a person who is old enough mature enough trustworthy of yourself enough to choose something this big. But tell me how that part well, went. Go further. With it. I love it. In the book, you talk about you introduce the the opportunity of both and that you can both be into a relationship and excited and grieving your identity shift, much like when people have kids, much like, you know, that we go from being single to be in a relationship to being in one like for life. I even remember, and this is an interesting analogy, but I remember when I got Carl, my dog, mm -hmm. that there was a part of me that was so excited to have a dog again. And then there was a part of me that was grieving all of the freedom that I had, where I didn't have to think about another being on a deep level, like I wasn't committed to supporting their life. And it was interesting to sit in that and not judge myself. And I think true relationally, you know, is that when you actually start to get into that space of, I think this also brings into the last question that was about like elation and then the settling, you know, honeymoon yeah. phase that turns into the sort of calming. And I think a lot of us in Dr. or sorry, um, John, the angry therapist, he talks oh, yeah. about how swimming past the breakers, right? Like getting past the place mm -hmm. we've never been going beyond. And I think when we've never sat in that stasis where we considered love to be calm or love to be safety or love to be stability and gen genuity. Is that the right? I think that's the right word. Genuine yeah. AD. Yeah, AD. yeah, yeah. Uh, that I find reasons to avoid going deeper. And I think, okay, well, let's, because you said, okay, well, what happens if we do explore that part a little bit? And I yeah. would think, what is it about deeper that scares you what's in deeper that you don't want to touch because you know like john kim says it's like that's the deep end that's the place in the pool that you got to swim past when you're surfing you got to swim past the breakers and and then you get to a different type of calm and so if we can i think often what happens and in your book you explore the skill sets that are necessary to do this boundaries communication exploring your patterns so in the book loving bravely for people who aren't who are new to this conversation. We're doing a book club and it's with Dr. Salman's book, which is incredible. It's like number one book you need to read relationally to start or to get better and continue to get better. And I think what's interesting is the thing we're afraid of that's in the deep end. And a lot of us were told don't swim in the deep end. And I think we were also told that explicitly and implicitly like never get married, everyone gets divorced, everyone's a cheater, or we just observed that. And if a relationship ended, we saw such judgment. So why start one? If it's just gonna end, they all end. I'm just never gonna start them. And so we hit this upper limit. We, we put our toes where we, they can just touch in the pool. And then we see all the stories that are beyond. They're like ghosts, you know, mm. in the end, like come this way, you'll just be divorced. Come this way, you'll cheat, they'll cheat. Everything yeah. sucks over here. Yeah. And so we go back. And we don't, what we don't realize is in the stories we're told lies the wisdom of how to get past it. So if I was to talk to someone yeah. who had been cheated on or cheated or a marriage ended, and I was to say, teach me about what you learned, which 
most people don't do because we exile people instead of invite them with the interests, you know, with, sorry, with their journey, with their story, with their wisdom. What was the upper limit you hit? And, and then they could tell us, and then we would learn. And if it was our own story, and we sat with the part of ourselves that was sad at the moment that we never want to touch again, the wound we've never really gone deeper with, that what lies in that pain is actually the skill set to go past into the deep end, which to me is a mind fuck because we're afraid of what's beyond, but what's actually beyond teaches you how to go beyond. And then you get to a place where you've never been before, which is how I feel now, which is like every time Kai and I get into some sort of challenge, I'm like, where's the skill set here? Because this is new territory. Yeah. Um, curious your thoughts oh. on that long, long barrage. I mean, I just like. have chills all over. I'm sure everybody in, on this call has them too. It's so beautiful, Mark. It's so beautiful. Like I, I think what you're, the, the piece about um, listening at the feet of those who have survived pain, we all, if we do it at all, which you're right, I think in general we don't do it. But if we do it at all, often the lens through which we're filtering the story is we're just trying to learn the things that they got wrong, like the sort of formula, the secret sauce, so that we won't yeah. ever have to live that, right? So we're, we use it like a sort of jinx or a spell or a magic. Like, I want your story so I can find the knots, right? Like the sort of not this. Um, rather than listening to the story to glean the wisdom and the resilience and the mm. getting up again after life kicks your ass. Like that, that's in the, the skills, that the skills and the tools are within there. It's a really different, you're inviting us into a different way of listening to painful stories because we, you know, we so often do listen. I mean, if, if people are willing to share their painful story with us, what if we listened a bit differently? Beautiful, it's just so beautiful. Well, that's part of it, right? That's part of the is being able to stand in the humility of that in 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 the awareness, you know, I think that's yes. the because there's sadness in there. There's sadness to know that we've experienced all the pain of it, you know, but to recognize, too, that in that sadness, there's actually a sad person that wants to tell the story of how they got sad. There's a sad part of us or yeah. an angry part of us that wants to share. And I think because I think this also adds to another part that's very true about society, which is because we're afraid of death and because we, you know, as Alan Watts says, we want apples that don't rot and women that don't age. I think what's interesting and in, in both ends are, there's so many both ends in there, is that, is that the, the fear of aging has locked the wisdom of elderhood yes. in in body manipulation and fillers. And that's not a judgment of those things, but rather to say there's so, because we are afraid of aging, we don't turn towards elders to say, what can you teach us? Or even people who have life experience because life experience shows age. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I think in a lot of ways, the conflicting story there is we find men who are aging handsome yeah. and we treat women who age as disposable. And there's so many layers to that. And, but I just wanted to name it because it's important. Oh, I love it. And just before we go on to the next one, because this ties into our book club, you know, this I see this all the time with, um, you know, parents and emerging adults. So every class I've ever taught, my undergraduate class, my graduate class, we always do a love template interview. And in the Loving Bravely book club, you will have a chance to do a love template interview where you go up your family tree to glean the stories and to learn the lessons. And what so often happens is the way the story gets told, like let's say your parents got divorced, the story they will tell you is don't do this, you know, don't get married till you're 30, don't trust a man, don't do this, don't do that, do this. They will, and, and I get it, listen, I am a parent. And so the biggest thing I was, I mean, I would, if I could spare my kids pain, believe me, I would spare them. Of course, <laughs> yeah. Pain. But when parents tell that story, what the kid loses, the emerging adult loses the, you know, you can be 45 and do a love template interview. Um, what you lose then is all of the hidden goodies and the treasures and the lessons and the growth. Um, and so I just plant that seed for any of you who are here that if you choose to join this book club, you know, we will, we, you will be guided through and supported to do a love template interview and maybe to have a chance to hear differently um, your family story that is not through the lens of a cautionary tale, 
but that is more a tale of wisdom and a tale of mm. humanity and a tale of people doing the best they could at the time they were doing it, which is all How we ever How important is that? Which is, mm -hmm. I, imagine if we could take our parents' story and our relational story and actually do that. Like that to me is, which you get to do in the Loving Bravely Book Club is you get to do what she's exactly saying is you get to go back and tell it in a way that's different. Tell it in a way that garners the wisdom that brings back all the parts of yourself that you've exiled. Yeah. Say like, what can you teach me to make me a badass lover today? Yeah. So that yeah. doesn't excite you. I mean, it does excite you. I'm a little aroused thinking about it, a different type of aroused. And I go to the link of my bio, sign up for the book club. It's gonna kick ass. Question four, Ron four. Okay, you ready? This is me to you or you to me? This is me to you. You to me, yeah. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Stretch, stretch it out. Stretch it out. Um, I have dated multiple people who made huge promises and declarations of love saying things like, you are the love of my life and I'll never find anyone like you. But then soon after, they either walked away or slowly started turning cold. How do I open myself up to hearing things like this again and actually believing them? Well, I think this brings up the subject of love bombing. Yeah. Because if it's early on and people are dropping L-bombs in like the first week and really creating this hook, right? This like, I love you. I've never met anyone like you. I can't wait to build a story with you. Listen, I think that stuff's okay once you're like, like I'm really feeling connected to you. Cool. I feel attracted. I feel like we're having a lot of fun getting to know each other. Those are normal. But in like the first week when someone's like, you are my twin flame. And this, I'm going to say that 99.9% .9 of the time I'm right. There will be a point zero 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 one that we all place our hope upon. Like I met that person and in the first week, we were so in love and then we stayed together forever. No, that's usually not how it happens. If we did a survey of all the people who dropped L-bombs in the first week, I would say that they're probably not together today for the most part. Now, um, again, I'm qualifying 99.9% .9 of the time. So I get it. You hear things like, you are the love of my life and I'll never find anyone like you. And then they walk away or slowly start turning cold. First, I wanna know where are they doing that? Like, are we like one week in the relationship? Are we a month in the relationship? Are we six months, a year in the relationship? Those declarations are different. Now, the other side is I'd say, are you hearing it and it's matching behavior? Because as soon as behavior and words don't match, most people say, uh, you know, believe what they believe actions over words. Yeah. And I would say, no, don't believe actions over words because sometimes you'll be treated like you're in a relationship and they don't want one. And then someone will tell you believe actions over words and you'll totally bypass the fact that they're telling you they don't want a relationship. And so you'll fall in love with the possibility of the story. And I think, so when I consider that, like the first part is that if there is a disconnect between actions and words, always get curious. Mm -hmm. because it's a, an orange flag, sometimes red. If there's love bombing really early, reddish flag. I also think what's interesting about this question is that I don't hear you saying that you're really in love and you've never met anyone like that and they are the love of your life. So how do you believe them, which is really about them? And I really want this person to start to see their relational story from a choice perspective that's about discernment. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's like, are they a good fit for me? Do I feel like they're the love of my life? Do I feel like I'll never find anyone like you? Like, listen, if Kai and I broke up, if Kai said, I never find anyone like you, the egoic part of me is like, yeah, she'll never find anyone like me. But the reality is there's over 7 billion people on the planet. She'll for sure find someone like me, you know? So it's not to say that I'm devaluing myself. I know uh -huh. my uh -huh. own worth. But what I'm saying is that I'm not, I'm not a fool to the story. Like I recognize that if we decided to part, I don't want her to never find someone again. I would want her to find someone again. And I think what's different about that is our love is free. It's not, not lost in this Disney story. It's real. Um, Mm -hmm. Anyways, what do you think about that? I kind of went on long. No, I think, it's, I think it's all, it's really, really, really helpful framing. 
I guess I'm, you know, I think that you, I think that love bombing, like lots of other things probably happens on a spectrum. And there probably are times where people love bomb, bomb consciously from a place of desiring to control somebody else, right? It's sort of like a fear loaded behavior, fear motivated behavior. And if I love bomb you, I can control you. It's harder to leave. I think that probably is that. But I think oftentimes love bombing is a, you know, can be just sort of a, a, a lack of a skill deficit, maybe some work around boundaries. But I also think, I remember a couple of years ago, I had a college student who she, she came to office hours and she's like, here's the deal. I fall really hard, really fast. Like I'm just, I do it with my friends. Like I do it with, I see a dog in the street. I'm in love. Like I just, I love, I love big. I love hard. I'm like a wide open channel for all of the things. And so we talked about the difference. You know, you're talking about the difference between words and actions, which I think is really wonderful. But I think the other kind of like non-concordance or like mismatch may be the way I feel on the inside is like, oh my God, I can completely like name our babies right now. But I notice it and I boundary it and I ground it and then I select what will I say? Not as a game playing, but just as this is how I manage me. What I know about me is I'm like a wide open vessel. I love big, I love hard. And then I choose. I work with it within myself so that I don't overwhelm my partner. Because if I tell you all that's happening on the inside of me, it really understandably might frighten you away. Or I watch your face change and then I feel ashamed. And now I got to run mm. because I like got totally <laughs> naked and you haven't even, you know, loosened up your tie. So it's, so there may be a piece of, you know, for, for anybody who's on this call who like feels like they have done that, like they've been the one who gets too excited and too wordy too fast. I think there is like a skill there to learn that doesn't mean suppressing your authentic self, but more so like practicing discernment. Yeah. Cause I think that idea of like, but it's just who I am is not taking responsibility for where there might be child energy spilling like right. a desperation a love story a finally you know we're not whenever we say it's just who i am it's not <laughs> actually taking responsibility for ourselves you know like i whenever i have worked with or dealt not all the time but often when i work with someone who's like more a bulldozer or like really i just tell the truth and i'm like yeah but are you taking responsibility for how you tell your truth like you tell it very intensely, which means you get significance and people will listen. But can you roll that back and express your truth and allow it to land with me and me choose whether I receive it and, it, and it's valid for me too. And I think with love, like I just love, I love how you are saying, do that and don't just spill it out because it's not for everybody. Mm. And if you just give it to everybody, and you're not discerning about it, you're gonna say, why do I attract this type of person? Why do I get taken advantage? Why do I attract narcissists? Why do I, because we're not being discerning. And I think this speaks to so much of our conditioning, which is if you're in a relationship, that means you're worthy of being chosen. And so get in a relationship before anything because no one wants to be single because if you're single, there's some Unworthy. stuff going on. Mm -hmm. There must be something wrong with you. And so we enter relationship without saying, wait, like I want to be the one for them because I feel connection instead of, are they actually the one for me? Like instead of just saying someone's the one, which is giving someone a title that they need to earn, yeah. it's being able to say, is this person a good fit and allow them to become the one, which is so different than I just, they just are the one, you know? That's right. That's right. Well, yeah. And I think I also maybe have, I have compassion for somebody who maybe is drawn to these grand declarations because it so fits with our romanticized notions of love that right. rather than, you know, you were saying in the beginning, like rather than saying, I enjoy spending time with you, your smile lights up the room. Um, I really enjoy, like, it's so cool how many activities we both like, or I love giving you a hug. Those things were like, wah, wah. like we sort of turn, we, we devalue those really thoughtful, accurate, gentle descriptions. We want like the, we want the big grand gesture. We want the big language. The big so I, sweeping story. Yeah. Or... So I wonder if, especially if this is, if the person who's saying this to our question asker, if that person is a man, I wonder the degree to which he has just also internalized a bunch of notions that to be a good man, 
you know, and we, in the heterosexual dynamic, we have taught men that they have to take the lead and set the relational pace. And so maybe he is misperceiving that this is like the appropriate way to set the pace is to be grand sweeping like night on you know night on the horse like sort of making the declaration of this is what it is in a way that we if i if we could whisper in his ear we'd be like just chill like chill go slower <laughs> get just, off the horse describe the moment to save her yeah right just track along with her read read the scene read the room <laughs> i think what's interesting about that too is as soon as you believe because you know we're all taught be a good provider, rescue her, fix everything, like, which doesn't work out very well, because the other side of that story, and I think this is true for people who grew up in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, now at least movies like Frozen are telling a bit of a different story. <laughs> What's fascinating, I watched Cruella the other day, Yeah, which is a fantastic uh, movie. But what's interesting about a lot of Disney movies is they involve being an orphan, so yep. losing your parent, and then um, being lost. And so they sort of like, to a child mind, it sort of appeals to a child's greatest fear. And so I think of like, what is the propaganda messaging that inserts psychologically in a child when they fall in love with these ideas that you need to be Snow White, you need to be a princess in a tower, you need to be laying on a train track waiting to be saved you need to like you might lose the person most important to you because a kid watches that movie and is so emotionally involved in that movie that it's hard for them to differentiate that that's not real life and then they might cling tighter to their parent i mean i just saw that the other day i wanted to bring it up because i'm like this is very true this is a consistent story of orphanage of someone yes. experiencing being orphaned that's right that's right uh-huh yeah should we take on disney right I love, I saw somebody just said, um, lost in musing says small things often, right? And maybe, maybe small things often wouldn't make as exciting of a Disney or a Pixar film, but that is, that's the nature of real love. It's a small things often. And even dating, dating can that's be small catch. things often, right? That's okay. Well, in the research, it's the micro moments that matter yeah. most. It's not the big gestures. It's not the anniversaries. It's, how do you interact with each other in all the moments, including the ones that are seemingly meaningless, mm -hmm. you know, in, in bids, responding to bids. You know, I remember as a kid watching my dad read the paper in the morning and my mom, you know, doing whatever she was doing. And my dad would go, huh. And it was like, so my mom would be like, oh, what are you reading? And that's a bid. And most people don't realize like simple bids, like when I'm reading something, and I want Kai, to, I think she might find it fascinating. Instead of saying, you might find it fascinating, I catch myself saying like, huh, that's interesting. Leaving the mystery for her to say, <laughs> tell me what's interesting. Right. Uh -huh. But it's a bid and bids are really important. And in the research, successful couples turn towards, I believe it's 87% of bids and couples that get divorced turn towards like 36% or something yeah. small, you know? Yep. Yep. Which is just a reminder. I mean, I think that reminder has always been important, but in the era, like your dad had a newspaper, which is far less dopamine, you know, firing than what we all hold in front of our face. Twitter now, or which, something, right? Yeah. So it's, it's such a good reminder to all of us about like attending to bids, those small moments that matter, even when there's some, you know, even when we're mid TikTok video or whatever. <laughs> okay. Question number five. Let's do this, everybody watching. Final question. We're going to crush this. We're going to have so much fun. This is recorded. So if you want to watch it after, boom, no problem. We're doing this because we got a book club. We're answering these questions. There's a book club that's going to be going on with Dr. Salman and I for her book, Loving Bravely, which is number one book to read if you want to get better at relationship, continue your dive into relationship. If you haven't read it, it's a must. And so who doesn't want to do a, a book club in the summer? Right. So, okay. Question five. You ready? I'm ready. Your hair looks ready. You look ready. Okay. My partner and I can't seem to discuss any issues without it blowing up like a personal attack. This makes the most mundane things spiral into arguments. We're stuck in some crazy trigger cycle where we fight about. I want to stop fighting. So I've signed up for this book club, but I don't know where to start when every conversation just blows up. Ooh. This is a good question because, hey, in the comments, who here can relate to fighting about fighting, fighting about not wanting to fight because we're doing all the same fucking cycle over and over again and we're fighting about everything or we're fighting about the same shit 
yep. all the time. It makes everybody want to pull their hair out. That's so, right. Who doesn't want to stop that shit? Nobody doesn't. Nobody doesn't. Nobody. Nobody all doesn't people, not, not want to stop. All the people do want. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's why we spend an entire, like, quarter of the book working on this. And, con I mean, conflict is woven throughout the book, but there is, like, literally a quarter of the book. And in the book club, I'm so excited that you all get the number one tool that I have been using. You know, I've been a couples therapist for 20-plus years. And one of my mentors, Dr. Mona Fishbane, um, who wrote the foreword to Loving Bravely, um, she wrote, she created a model. Um, the article came out in 2004. You also get the article in the book club if you want to like super nerd out and read an academic article. But basically it is the best tool for holding on to the internal stuff within conflict and the relational dance, because that's what conflict is. It's what's happening inside of me, what's happening inside of you and the relational dance between. And this tool, it's called vulnerability cycle mapping. I use it with every single couple in my caseload. I have, I sometimes will just sit in couple sessions with their vulnerability cycle on my lap so I can reference it if I need it. I've had couples put them up on their fridge. Um, it is such a helpful tool for breaking out of this dance because what she's, what this person is saying is we just get stuck in the dance and the dance takes over. And that is true. And we learn how to trigger each other. And the more we trip that wire, the easier it is to trip that wire. So I, I love that they're in, um, they said they're in the book club now, right? Yeah, I signed yeah, up. Yeah, they signed up, I love they're that. ready. They don't even know that they're about to get vulnerability cycled. It's so good, they're so good. They're just essential. And then you get savvy. It's mind blowing. You, it's yeah. mind blowing when you do it. Cause you're like, wait, that's so simple. That's right, that's right. It's so simple. That's right. And so then we can, then what they can start to say to each other is aha, here we go again, we're starting to do that thing. And the fact that the cycle, it doesn't matter if you said the thing or if I said the thing, so this, the cycle can start anywhere. And then it empowers both of us to sit, to, to verbalize the vulnerability. I'm afraid that you are, when, when you say this in situation Y, I start to feel Z, like then we can use the tools and the strategies because we're savvy now about the dance. So that is, um, that's what I would say about that. I mean, there's lots of, I think also the other thing they're going to get in the book club is just a whole bunch of skills for empowered communication. Say this, not this. This, you know, when you say it like this, it promotes conflict. When you say it like this, it promotes intimacy. And how, when do we ever learn that language? Like we, you know, this is stuff that I want all of us to have as early in our lives as we can, because maybe you grew up with parents who know how to, who knew how to use intimacy promoting language when activated, but most likely they swept it under the rug or they finger pointed or they yelled. So you get to now learn how to do it differently. Yeah. And that's what we all want to learn is how do I, I know I do this thing, but I'm going to keep doing this thing because I don't know how to not do this thing. And what you need is a partner who wants to not do that thing too. And then, as you said, it doesn't matter where you are in the cycle. And this is the book we'll talk about vulnerability cycles and language that allows you to change this dance. That's so damn frustrating for all of us. I saw the question, how do I sign up? Go to the link in my bio or Dr. Salman's bio and you could sign up. So just go to the link, sign up. We're starting uh, the early birds till the 26th, I believe, or something like that. I early birds 17th. We, I think early, early birds 17th. And we launched the 26th. We're launching That's soon. That's right. That we launch very soon. Yeah. So in this idea of, okay, so we're in the same fight. We keep having the same thing over and over again. And we are stuck in this cycle because it doesn't matter what we're fighting about. We still have the same cycle. Right. And I love the thought, and you said it's a cycle. So it's, it's not like it's who you are. Your patterns are not who you are. So you can change them, mm -hmm. right? And we don't know the language that is intimacy promoting. We don't know. And you stop that one spot, because if the cycle, you know, the cycle is a circle. So if I stop here and I all of a sudden go, hey, there's that sensitivity I have that whenever I feel like you're going to leave, I get more reactive and I bark at you, which makes you want to leave more. So if I, if you cannot leave, that's one way to stop it. But you might also be overwhelmed and that might be tough. And I also have to learn how to de-escalate myself. So in the pattern, they're because they even say they're fighting about fighting now. They fight about how they fight. Uh, and this is such a beautiful opportunity to look 
at the behaviors, and you talk about this in the book, to look at your story and the experience of your relational behaviors, like an anthropologist studying something. Mm. And I love that because it distances our identity from our behaviors. And then we're able to say, oh, there's that thing I do, not that thing I am. You know what I mean? It's, it's vitally important. It's not, and, and also that um, there's that thing that you do versus the person that you are, right? Because it's, it's also, it's about giving us both the generosity um, that we're focusing on the behaviors and not the identity or this, you know, um, forever like label that, that rings true. Yeah, it is. Um, and I think the other thing, you know, John Gottman's research showed this. If you, you can take a really healthy couple and trigger them and, and it's really hard to extricate the conflict. Like once we get triggered, you know, we, we think that we got these fancy, fancy brains of ours, but like the part of our brain <laughs> that can see the whole dance and think relationally, the prefrontal cortex, it's the newest part of our brain. It's rather fragile and it, it, does, it goes offline pretty easily and the amygdala, right? The like, older part of our brain takes over and the amygdala cannot do things like, I see your perspective. I appreciate you bringing that to me. Let <laughs> the me amygdala think. doesn't even know how to say that. It's like, no. fuck you, right. you're so fucking wrong. I'm or sorry, I'm out of here. Get me out of here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the, there's a whole, like, there's literally a chapter in the book called, like, Respect the Pause. Like, we don't pause nearly enough. And it's so loving. And it's not fleeing, right? Many of us grew up in a home where, like, when a parent got upset, they, like, fled the house. And that was scary and confusing. So we're talking about intentional timeouts, mindful timeouts. I love you too much to keep talking to you right now. I don't want to say something I'm going to regret later. So I think I really want to normalize that sometimes these conversations have to happen over a series of episodes because once we are triggered, our IQ drops, our perspective changes, it does become me versus you rather than you and I versus the problem. And so we just need to pause regulate and then communicate. I do have to also say that it has continuously taken me time to get better and better at this. Yes. Like as someone who could not really communicate unless it was about chocolate or puppies or ice cream or something like that, that as soon as it was about a feeling, I would lock up in my throat, my body would shut down, I would freeze. Um, sometimes I would leave hoping they would come get me, but that never really worked. Uh, I just ended up being gone by myself, <laughs> you know, and it's taken me so much time to like learn how, learn these words to use. And you say the book is titled Loving Bravely for good reason, because it is a courageous act to be in a conflict and normally shut down or normally get defensive and actually say, I love us too much right now to continue the way we're going. I recognize that my trigger of this is coming up right now. I just need to take a breath and to just slow down. And I'd really like to change this cycle. Can we do that together? Like, I don't know that there's a more beautiful invitation in a partnership because then the other person goes, you were brave enough to be the vulnerable one to end the cycle. Can I actually, I can do this with you. I think I can. And what's so interesting about that cycle change is that we've likely never been there before, yep. except with pain. So we've never been there in a surrendered state. We're usually so guarded that now when I'm in it with you and we both put our weapons down and we allow ourselves to connect, it's such a, it's so beautiful. Like it shows you that that's when you start to see that relationships are transcendent. Yes. That's when you start to see that relationships, that's where wounds occur and that's where they get healed. And what you're inviting in your book, Loving Bravely, is to love bravely. Is mm -hmm. that like, how do I love someone and not cling to them? Mm -hmm. And I was just listening to Richard Rudd who wrote Gene Keys and really uh, fascinating guy. And he was saying, whenever we cling, the love is somewhat tainted by fear. And it's because we haven't fully moved into unconditional love yet. But to actually sit in the space of not clinging or not fighting is to actually sit in a space of discomfort within ourselves, a space of chaos, maybe anxiety, maybe nervousness, maybe whatever it is. 
Um, but what's beyond it is the love story we're all, we all yearn for, but think it just lands on our lap, which it doesn't. It takes concerted effort and intentional work and your book, Loving Bravely, invites us to do that. So I'm so excited to be doing this book club with you. And for the people watching, if this gets you going, I mean, it, I would imagine it gets you going because you're like, shit, I will fucking want that. We all fucking want that. But someone lied to us and said, you just find it and it just shows up and it's just yeah. there and it's always good. Good is this idea that there's no conflict. It's how you manage conflict that's important and that's how you get to know each other on a deeper level. So. If that gets you pumped up, which I think it does, because you're watching this and you follow Create the Love and Dr. Salman, um, click the link in my bio and sign up because it's going to be fucking awesome. And you're being led by one of the best relational teachers in the world. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, that's not a marketing line. This, this woman is a fucking relational genius. And you have taught me so much that to be able to be in the company of your wisdom and the love that you put into everything that you do I mean, that's, that's you. You just care so much about uh, people learning how to be in good, healthy relationships. And so you've made that your mission, not just in your personal life with Todd, but in how you teach your work. And so mm -hmm. I am so grateful for you and your time and that you even were like, yeah, hell yeah, I'll do a book club with you. Um, so thank you. I, well, you know, everything, I, I just write back at you. And I know everyone who is here is so grateful, Mark, for how you show up every day and invite us into this and you make connections and you create spaces for all of this. And I, I love it. I love, I love the chances I have to work with you and to deepen our friendship. And I just, I'm grateful for all of it and so excited for all of you. And I'm, you know, if you have questions, you're welcome to send me an email or a DM. I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you have about the book club and, um, and our journey. I can't wait to get started. So everybody, if you want to dive deeper into your relational patterns and actually create the freaking relationship that you dream of, whether you're in one or single, it doesn't matter. You can do it. Um, sign up, click the link in my bio or, and right now we have early bird pricing. So you save 50 bucks. Uh, you can go to create the love.com slash loving bravely, or again, go to the link in my bio. It's super easy. The book club launches on July 26th. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to jam with us. Dr. Salman, thank you so much. Bye-bye.